Hi, everybody. My name is Maura Keith. I'm one of the scholars in residence. Uh, welcome to Pillow Talks, the first of uh, the series this summer. The title of today's talk is Ted Sean, His Life, Writings, and Dances. And uh, we lifted this title from this book here. And of course, I did dress like the book cover, which I don't always do, but <laughs> it's a great color. And you may have noticed my colleagues inside as well. Uh, the title, we we got this title, it wasn't, wasn't Norton's idea, it wasn't Pam's idea, it wasn't mine, it was Paul Scalieri's idea. Uh, Paul is the chair and professor of dance at uh, Barnard College. In addition to this book, pub published by Oxford University Press, he is the author of Dancing the New World, Aztecs, Spaniards, and the Choreography of Conquest. A dogged researcher, according to Deborah Cash in Arts Views, Paul has been a frequent Pillow resident during the process of writing this book, and we are delighted he's back and his book is with him. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to give you the five cent biography of Ted Sean first. Pillow founder, director of the all male touring ensemble Ted Sean and his men dancers in the 1930s, founder and, perfor uh, and performer, teacher director of Dennis Sean, the touring ensemble in school in the 19 teens and 20s with his wife Ruth St. Dennis, choreographer, author. So while today's, uh, that's the five cent biography, this is the 39.95 biography. <laughs> so the book's subject is Ted Sean. And, and of, of course, because we're talking about the book, we'll talk about him, but really I'm interested in us talking about the process of writing this uh, biography. And I've been thinking about the, the so-called difference between a commemorative versus critical biography. And uh, in um, Hans Renders writes in The Roots of Biography, he distinguishes between commemorative on the one hand and critical on the other, and he says, the nature of the research that is conducted beforehand marks the real difference between the commemorative and the critical. The author of a commemorative biography cannot derive any benefit from sources that dispute the good reputation of his hero and therefore will not work exhaustively to unearth those sources. So I'm wondering, before we even dive into your book, what do you think about this distinction of commemorative on the one hand and, and critical uh, or on the other, and are they absolutes? I don't know if they're absolutes, but what I would say in terms of writing about Ted Sean's life, I was acutely aware from the outset that um, there's a legacy project involved in his story, in part because he told that story better than anyone else. And in fact, one of the remarkable, th remarkable things about Ted Sean was not only that he wrote the narrative of his life, he was a prolific writer, but he also left, one of my favorite stories about Ted Sean is that he left instructions for future writers about how to write his story. And even going as far as to list titles of books that they should write to um, do his life service. So there was already a roadmap there. Part of what interested me in writing this book, because I didn't set out to write a biography to begin with, was realizing that his life was central to say, telling anything about his impact on the dance world the, 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 um, his inner circle that he, um, his mentors, his interlocutors, his lovers, were central to the story of how he impacted dance. So um, there was a legacy project there. Part of what fascinated me as a historian was to say, this story has been told in various ways, and he told it. Um, but there were parts that were untold for many good reasons. And so part of what I was interested in was telling the untold part of that story not because Sean wasn't fully aware of it, but he knew he couldn't tell it fully. He tried at different times. So I was interested in telling um, the untold part of his, of his life. I mean, I think one of the reasons I was thinking about this kind of distinction between commemorative and critical is people's lives are, they're not ever one thing. And even in, your, in the very uh, opening line of the book, you say, Ted Sean, give his dates, and then it says, was the self-proclaimed father of American dance, a title he repeatedly justified by, by enumerating his many accomplishments in the field as a series of firsts. So you name him uh, it, right there. Self-proclaimed feels like both admiration, but maybe also already embedded in there a kind of uh, critical remark about that. Right. I think that there are ways that we could say he was the father of American dance. I'm not sure we need a father of American dance. The point, I was interested in why is it we accept that, that um, title, but also why was it so important for him to name that way? But also, um, I think 
throughout the book with that spirit, that sort of tension that's even within constantly saying he's the self-proclaimed father of American dance and never sort of being complicit in the story he told was um, realizing that he made tremendous space for dance in American culture and for a life for himself. But in creating that space, he also diminished space, ran over space. You know, there was also a lot of um, fallout from that project. And so the book tries to chart both what he opened up and what he also closed down as a result. I mean, um, one of the things that I think is fascinating is that we, we maybe imagine that people are documenting their lives in this part of the 21st century in a different kind of way. Social media, we share photos, like we just we took a snapshot that I'm gonna to post to Instagram, that we might write blog posts or, or whatever. Um, and, and I think we might imagine that that's a new thing, but Sean himself, you talked about this, how he's documented his life. And maybe you could uh, talk about why, why you were able to get to more than the story he wrote and, and the untold story. Sure. Um, I do want to answer that. I just want to add one thing about commemorative, mm -hmm. and I think it's important. I think in dance history and in dance studies, a lot of scholars have written more commemorative projects because we just need to create space and awareness for dance history. So there's that burden and pressure to acknowledge the merits of an art form or lives that are, you know, for, for the most part, unknown beyond a small dance world. Ted's, Sean's story was different because there's the pillow. He had a visibility and I think he's, you know, there's a wider circle that, um, um, that people were aware of him. Wait, and hold on, I want to say, so what, just to the first no. part that you're saying is that like maybe there's the one book about, about an artist like, I don't know, uh, I don't know, let's say there's more than one book about Alvin Ailey, but maybe there's three books about Alvin Ailey and he's a leading figure in American modern dance history. But maybe there's no book written about Doris Humphrey. Or there's, and so you're saying that, that in even trying to make dance history be something that's written down, there might be a tendency to say, let's celebrate these people, rather than write a book about Doris Humphrey to say she was really terrible. Right, yeah. or the, the burden to just create space for other artists and to create awareness. And someone, you know, I will say from the outset, my concern, I didn't start off writing a biography, but I was interested in Ted Sean, but a lot of these, to access archives and to access materials to be able to tell a story about a life is difficult. And so what would it be for me to come to some place like Jacob's Pillow where Ted Sean's legacy is important and is a part of this world and to say, oh, I want to write about Ted Sean's relationship to eugenics, or I want to explore his relationship to um, sexology, right? And there was never a moment here at The Pillow, thanks to Norton, um, oh, and the director of preservation, um, you know, controlling what could be seen and what would not be seen, what I could access and what I couldn't do. And I think in some instances, dancers or their children who inherit their legacy or their archives are tightly controlled those for good reason. Um, but that was never the case here. So the fact that this biography is even possible is because there was access to these free access and a place at the pillow that cultivates conversations around Sean, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So that's vital. And then it's also what you were speaking to about the vast quantity of material that Ted Sean left. He had materials from when he was a very young boy that he saved. The idea that he lived this long life, never really having until, you know, till later in life a home, that he still saved all of these materials, photographs, scripts, letters, tells us something about how he envisioned his life, that it was one worth um, saving these material and ephemera because he had it, an, a notion that his story would be important to tell one day. And uh, do you think he would have wanted I mean, you're, this is me asking you to invent. You've lived in the, with the man for 10 years now. Um, do, you, do you think he would have wanted the open access? Oh, absolutely. He was one of, he, his collection is one of the first at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts, the Dance Division, which is one of the largest archives. Um, his was one of the first collections that were um, curated there, that were, were taken in. And he did not put many restrictions on it. And in the archive that he gave over are diaries, letters, let me tell you, if anyone's planning on writing a biography, choose a subject like Ted Sean, who types all of his letters <laughs> and also saves the carbon copies <laughs> um, of letters outgoing. So I had a complete record of letters that he wrote 
and um, that went out that typically you don't see when you're writing a biography. So it was, it was amazing to have that sort of access. So uh, I'm thinking about this notion of how maybe you didn't set out to write a biography and that's where you arrived. And one way that I see that is, you know, I keep everything too. So let me, tra let me tell you how I tracked the changing title of your book. In 2010, you said the title of your book was Eugenic Dancer, Ted Shawn, Modern Dance and the Science of Race Betterment, in quotation marks. Uh, 2015, the book was titled Ted Sean and the Invention of, America, uh, of American Dance and Where We Landed When the Book Was Published. Let's start with the first one, because I remember uh, Paul sent me a draft of uh, an application he was submitting to the National Endowment of the Humanities about Ted Sean and his uh, uh, relationship with eugenics. And I was like, oh my God, this is the story that's going to be told. And what, what, what is this going to mean? That In that same way you were just saying, if we're only going to tell one story of Ted Sean, is this the story? Um, t tell us about how that, that was your starting place. Um, first of all, I don't keep records, so people can't tell me <laughs> <laughs> about my previous... I try not to leave tracks like that, so <laughs> kudos to your research skills. I actually, the first time I came to the pillow, pillow to research Sean was, I was finishing up the book on Mexico and 16th century Mexico and dancing in Mexico. And I knew that Ted Sean created what was his first, what he called full length da modern dance, which was the first, rather than a short solo or a group work, it was an evening length work that had in it a scene that um, dramatized the conquest of Mexico with Ted Sean in full regalia dressed as Montezuma which one critic said made him look like Mae West. <laughs> and I said, why was Ted Sean? And then I was reading, and Ted Sean was talking about how he had read this really important book about the conquest of Mexico. And I was just fascinated that why was Ted Sean reading this leading book about the conquest of Mexico that was very really changed the way people saw uh, colonial Mexico, and he was not only reading it, but he was writing a dance inspired by it. So I came, I was just interested in what the impact was of my first research to that, and I was in the archives, and um, it was at that time that Norton actually handed me a folder um, and said, you might want to look at this. And it was actually a, um, a three-page screen typed um, scenario for a ballet called The American Ballet, which is also the name of one of his books. It's called The American Ballet. And it was to um, a sort of pageant of many different racial and ethnic types and a lot of drama. And at the end, he um, appears as some sort of messianic figure who leads the diversity of America into some um, unified whole. But it was drawing on language of the eugenics movement. So it was looking at this text, realizing, oh, the, the language. And for those of you, um, just to say eugenics for Ted Sean, he was thinking about this. It was a pseudoscience of a way, or it was a sort of philosophy or social approach that was thinking that um, there was a way to steer um, culture into a, a sort of a, a, an ideal direction, right? And But within that, and there are benefits to eugenics. A lot of the eugenic thinking supported labor movement and women's rights. There were a lot of positive aspects to some of the eugenics thinking, but we also know that it also led to deeply racist applications. Um, and so for Sean, he was interested in how the eugenics movement and the grip that it took on American society could also be a way to talk about dancing, that dancing could be a way to create a better America. That's give, how he adopted it. Give us a, a sort of historical landmark. What, when, when was he think writing the script for American Ballet? So in the late, uh, I think the, the script was written in 1922. Um, and it was also interesting because one of the pioneers of the eugenics movement was Havelock Ellis. Who, and Havelock Ellis also write about, wrote about dance. So Sean already knew about Havelock Ellis from this essay that was published in the United States where Havelock Ellis was talking that there was some supreme religious biological imperative to dancing. And Sean loved this because he hadn't read anything that talked about dance in such you know, um, important ways. Um, and also because Havelock Ellis wrote um, or co-wrote um, the first English language book on homosexuality. So when Ted Sean was um, a college student, he worked at a library that had only one of 12 copies of the Havelock Ellis book. 
and he would read all the books that were locked up behind the librarian's desk. Um, and, he, and at that point, only um, you know, political figures or doctors had access to this book that actually talked about homosexuality, but in a way that depathologized it, that did not say it wasn't criminality, it wasn't um, uh, immorality, that tried to talk about it in a more liberating way. So Ted Sean, as a, as a teen in, or in a young man, had access to ideas about sexuality that American culture hadn't yet fully known about, and it came from Havelock Ellis. So part of what I'm interested in the book is how Ted Sean had some understanding, both um, about what homosexuality was and about his own um, orientation and sensibility before he even went into the world. And I think I, what I say in the book is when Ted Sean was born, there was the term modern dance, neither modern dance nor homosexuality existed, right? And part of what the book tries to look at is how his life um, looks at those intersections. And um, I'm gonna ask you more about that in a minute, but I, I, I wanna ask you about like, well, what were the things that you were finding in 2010 in the archives here or in the Harvard Theater Collection th that um, were discoveries that were maybe changing the way you were thinking about, maybe it's not this sort of narrative of what you anticipated thinking about the, uh, the eugenics m movement and modern dance in general, but more about Sean, that, that the biography starts to emerge or the notion of a biography starts to emerge in a different way? That's a great question. I think what I started to understand a little bit more, what I needed to study more, and there's still a lot of work we need to do around what the vaudeville history was and what the experience of dance on the vaudeville stage. So there wasn't a lot of material for me to understand there. And so part of what I began to recognize was how Sean was both complicit in certain practices of the vaudeville stage, stealing routines, um, for example, or even his brand of um, performing racial or ethnic stereotypes was very common on the vaudeville stage. Um, what became interested, interesting to me as I started to look at what was going on in the film industry and what was going on in the theater was to see how Sean was in some way aligned with those practices, but also doing things differently, and where and when he had the opportunity to um, uh, do things differently that he, um, that he did. That, so for instance, I think one thing that was important was, whereas there was a whole spate of films and theatrical productions around um, desert films, or about dancing, um, uh, uh, dancing girls in the desert, this became and the one Valentino film was extremely popular and catapult um, Valentino into fame and Sean wanted to get some of that um, luster. So he went to North Africa. He goes on a trip to Spain first and then goes through North Africa, goes through the desert without you know, finding a translator, without really knowing what he's looking for. But he had this compulsion and need to be as authentic as possible. This turns out to be really troubling for him, but he had this sort of, he saw himself somewhat as a scholar and wanted, his whole brand was based on a level of authenticity that had some sort of um, studied um, connection to the material. It didn't always make it right, mm -hmm. and well, it never made it necessarily right, but it, it was his way of distinguishing himself in a field of theatrical practice where people were just wholesale creating fantasies of other times, people, and places. So uh, dance writer Janine Parker, writing in uh, the local to us Berkshire Eagle, uh, reviews this book and says, Scalieri honors Sean with deep research and thoughtful presentation of many other aspects of the subject's life and art, from his sexuality to his religious beliefs to his championship of the male dancer. A responsible biographer, Scalieri is clear-eyed about the problematic areas, including Sean's and St. Dennis's interest in eugenics and the ways in which some of their dances cross the line from homage to cultural appropriation. So I've been thinking about um, the, the life of your research and how we have um, gotten much more comfortable in uh, public discourse in reckoning with what does it mean for cultural appropriation and how maybe in 2010 you're thinking about it in a particular way, but over the life of this book, some of Sean's work, like you, you've had to really dig perhaps more uh, deeply and with more care to those, that uh, 
part of his career, which is which is a particular part. It's when he's coming out of, um, it's what he's doing with Denishon, it's what he's doing in the, the earlier part of his career that maybe he doesn't do, uh, doesn't continue to do. And I just wonder if you could talk about like, how how that was both maybe a um, a challenge but also a gift. I think what I started to do there was some. How do I answer this? I think I became attuned to where Sean was actually listening to criticism that was happening in real time. So, for instance, um, the with his Dennis Sean company, which lasted between 1915 and 30, a lot of their repertory was based on what was called Oriental dances. So these sort of full scale, fully costumed dramas based on. Um, Chinese, Japanese, Indian myth and ritual. Um, when Ted Shawn and Ruth St. Dennis and Dennis Shawn have an opportunity to travel what, the Far East in 1925, 1926, they arrive in Tokyo and fully prepare to perform for Japanese audiences. And Shawn on the spot says, we're not performing the Oriental dances. So really the dances that have become the hallmark of the Dennis Shawn enterprise all of a sudden became a liability rather than what they were before. So something that he was touring comfortably throughout the United States and they were all doing without comment. To great claim. And um, there he didn't want to do it. Now whether he doesn't, I wish I would know more about what that thinking was, but I think he didn't want to be, one, embarrassed that he had it wrong, or two, he was worried about either insulting sensibilities. Um, so there's that. So they tour for 18 months. They go throughout the Far East, India, they come back to Tokyo. By the time they come back to Tokyo, Tetchon goes to a musical review in Tokyo, and he sees that the dancers are performing what they call American dances, American Denishon dances. So the Japanese artists are performing their versions of Denishon dances that they had seen 18 months before. More than that, he sees that in the tourist shops, they're selling Ruth St. Denis and Ted Sean Hakata dolls, which are, and he's thinking, what happened? He, you know, he, he was so cautious about not crossing or transgressing this line in that moment. And then he sees how, what an impact Dennis Sean had on local dance culture there. And he came back. And at first he was, I think, upset. Um, but, and then he writes something like, this is sort of ingenious, the way that um, the Japanese sort of adopted marketing campaigns and visual culture, they're also taking our dances. And then, and then he did go on to perform uh, their oriental dances when they come back in to Tokyo. Many, many that were taught from the imperial school masters in Japan before he left. So he, he felt like he had the license to perform these dances because they were taught from those who were you know, in charge of safeguarding them. I mean, I, I, I have been thinking about this because we have talked about this in the past, the, that kind of notion of whether he's going to North Africa, whether he's going to Japan, that he study, he finds a master teacher and then feels like um, he has been given permission in a certain way um, to do the dances. And we would not, in the 21st century, think that we had a license to, to I've, I've studied this thing, I've studied it seriously, or I've studied it briefly. We wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't necessarily think we had the right to do that. But the understanding of what who owns a dance is different in 1922, for example. That's right, because there wasn't a structure for you know, choreographic payment in the same way. I mean, he would choreograph routines for his students who went off in vaudeville and made a lot of money. So he would teach them. He would, you know, they would pay him, and they'd go off and perform routines that they would claim as their own. Um, sometimes they gave credit when it was to their benefit because it was a Ted Sean dance. But I think implicit in learning the dance was that they had the license to teach it. And that's the way he saw it with a lot of the masters from dances that he taught, that in that exchange and teaching that dance, there was no pretense that he was going to perform these dances, whether it was a Spanish dance or whether it was another dance in his um, concerts. So he really saw it as an agreement between dancing masters rather than you know something that he was... Um, that he thought he was stealing necessarily. Although there are some dances that we were not taught, were wholesale made up out of images or films that were not sort of created out of some um, experience learning from a master. So there are those dances as well. 
So, can you talk about why you think he um, sought those kinds of iconic dance images that Montezuma, we see him in, in a, um, a Native American regalia, indigenous American regalia in the portrait in the reading room. I mean, what was he looking for in those kinds of um, not white um, images of men that he was tapping into? <clears throat> I think there are three th reasons. He was trying to build an American ballet, so he needed to create a theatrical art form that was not ballet, that was so associated with European culture. Um, and for that, he was seeking other movement forms. He was also needed a scenario for him to perform because men did not perform in dance. Men did not dance um, in an expressive manner at this time. This was not common. And in the the scenarios of Montezuma, or in the um, Eagle Warrior, or in the Japanese Spear Dancer, in these mythical heroic characters that he drew from, gave him, a, you know, they, that those became the conditions for him to appear on stage without having his masculinity assailed, because they were priests, they were sacred, they were warriors, they were heroes. Um, so. Um, he couldn't play Ted Sean dancing expressively on stage. That would not work. So he sort of drew from the sacred and um, cultural um, imprimatur that these roles had in order to carve out a space on stage for him to dance. Also, these dances gave him a way to choreograph in a way that wasn't about a man and woman dancing on stage. Because what was typical at this time was the sort of spec you know, spectacle of um, uh, heteronormativity. That's why you dance. So a woman and a man could find each other. But in these dances, he found a way for him to choreograph something on stage that was something other than having to perform compulsive heterosexuality. Um, and, go ahead. There's a third reason. I'll come back to it after you ask. Okay, I was just, <laughs> um, did you find him, um, either in his published writings or in his letters, uh, or unpublished writings, him acknowledging that that kind of, I mean, because I think one of the things that I always find remarkable about Sean, and I would say it about uh, Martha Graham, that that they, in building a new dance form, they also were articulating its its importance at the same time. That they didn't necessarily uh, feel like they didn't have to advocate in writing or in um, speaking about the importance of what they were doing. So there's his sort of public, I'm doing this thing, I, it's a, it, is, um, it is a high art form. And Isadora Duncan did it as well. But do you also find in his writings the sort of like acknowledgement of, I get to be the sexy guy on stage? I mean, I say that because um, Barton Mumaw's wonderful memoir, and Barton Mumaw was a, a Dennis Sean dancer who became one of Ted Sean's uh, men dancers on the weather vane and longtime partner of Sean, he writes kind of frankly about that in, in the 80s, about the kind of, we had to shave to because we were, wore such scantily, you know, we were so scantily clad, and an acknowledgement of the kind of real beautiful physicality they were putting on stage. Does Sean talk about it in that kind of um, frank way? I guess that's what I'm... In short, no. He doesn't talk about it. The, there's a... Um, one of my favorite archives finding this research was um, a series of 80 journals left by Lucian Price, who was a writer um, for the Boston Globe. He wrote about music and dance, and he saw Ted Sean's Men Dancers. This was a different company than Dennis Sean in the 1930s. He had the first all-male dance ensemble, and Lucian Price thought this company was for him the vehicle for um, sort of opening people's hearts to um, homosexuals, that he actually saw the company as a sort of, he likened it to this Greek idea of the um, um, uh, the sacred legion, which was from Greek myth. Anyway, he thought that this company would be able to widen people's perceptions and um, ideas. This was never explicitly stated, but in these journals and letters to Ted Sean, they talk about this endlessly. So when Ted Sean talks about what the men dancers was in his heart or what his vision for it comes across most clearly 
in his letters to Lucien Price and in conversations that were sort of reflected in Lucien Price's journals. But I think you, people could look at the images of Ted Sean and his men dancers and they're scantily clad and they're gorgeous and um, there's, you know, in usually in choreography that's almost paramilitary in these sort of heroic poses, right? So on the one hand, you could look at this and see this is, you know, a certain hyped up masculinity um, or sort of, you know, spectacle of beauty, right? But in reading what Ted Sean and what he was reading and how he was writing about these dances, there were ideas about democracy, about love, about um, politics that were not explicit because he was performing these dances in gymnasiums in small towns across the country, right? So they had to read and be legible. I should also say the men dancers were the sort of magic mic of the 1930s. So, you know, they were popular among the sorority circuit and garden parties where these young hungry men, hunky men would dance and, and um, you know, so there was that. But behind that, and I think that's what we think, we understand, okay, we understand what this is, but reading the journals, we understand that he had a much wider and deeper ambition of what this company could be. And so that's where we read about, um, I think, his ambition for what the company was. And if I could just go back also to say, what was it about the you know, uh, ethnic and racial um, influences in his choreography? Um, he was, Sean was deliberate about what narratives he would dramatize. And more often than not, almost exclusively, they were, had some sacred significance. So Sean's big mission was to elevate dance into an art form. Um, away from, I think, 19th century perceptions of dance being an entertainment or a commercial, um, uh, you know, only a commercial activity or something that was rendered to the stage, he wanted to elevate it into an art. And that was one of his missions. And the, his argument for that was that dance was a path to, you know, divinity, that it, there was a sacred order, that there was a religious dimension to it that was global and throughout time. So the narratives that he chose and the myths and stories were many times religious ones because it was the way that he could draw upon it to make the argument that dance can be something other than entertainment or something other than sexual play. So um, one of the things I was thinking about when simply even just reviewing the uh, table of contents is the choice to tell a story in a particular order. And, uh, and you... Uh, let us live Ted Sean's life as he lived it in in a chronological order, and I'm wondering if you, if if you thought about as you were constructing it because you also have it that, like he has some pretty clear chapters of his life that allow you to think about Dennis Sean, men dancers opening the the theater that kind of thing that that allow you to kind of organize it that way, but ha did you explore kind of other kinds of ways of thinking thematically, or did chronology feel like it really made the most sense? I mean, obviously it made the most sense because that's what you chose, but. It did. It's also a function of the fact that I didn't set out to write a biography, and so there's that, and so it started, I'm gonna write about Dennis Sean and eugenics in early modern dance. Oh, but the men dancers, I have to include that. But oh, you really can't understand then the pillow. So it ended up, okay, I'm, I'm, go, I'm all in at this point. So there was that. But oddly, I think Sean lived his life in chapters. I think he, you know, he, everything was dated, everything was organized. He, had, he was a very nostalgic person. He was very sentimental. He saved things, but I think he also had an ordered life. And when he made a commitment to something, he saw it through. And so I think also it sort of reflects a, a way he lived his life. I mean, I, I've been thinking a lot about that as we are here at the 90th anniversary of The Pillow and the 80th anniversary of the theater, that that kind of, it, it allows a kind of reflection. And and it really is, there's this whole life of um, Dennis Sean that is, perhaps, that is the, the, the thing that is most problematic when we're looking at it from a 21st century perspective and thinking like, where did she dare get off wearing that outfit? Or how dare he um, learn this dance rather than inviting somebody to do the dance with him or something? And then by the time we get to the, the building of the theater and the festival, he's making room for some of those people that you were sort of indicating that earlier he had maybe taken up space rather than making space. And could you say something about that? Yeah, I, look, I think when Sean was transitioning away from Dennis Sean into the men dancers, 
there was a big turn on him. He was aware of that. His dancers turned on him. I think this, the type of choreography he was producing, the critics, producers didn't. I mean, it's sort of, he ran, exhausted that mode of working and he had to redefine the, himself. Uh, the mode of De Denishon. The mode of Denishon, yeah. yeah. Um, right, so, I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm just thinking about, well, maybe it's that, the kind of, the, the era of, also in cinema, of the, that kind of grand spectacle of Im imaginary lives of, peop of uh, the other rather than the lives here. And then he comes here and he's starting over. Right, thank you. And now I remember the question. Right, so when he comes to the, Jacob's Spell, I, do th I know this. Um, part of his programming philosophy that he held on to was that there would be ballet, there would be modern dance, and there would be ethnic or race dance, as he problematically categorized everything else that wasn't ballet or modern. But he wanted to create space for other artists to um, be here. And in some way, it was amends for the sort of sh shadow he cast on many artists by performing all of these roles, or the sort of impact that his choreography had, that he already sensed, you know, that sensibilities had changed. So he was devoted to that, even when John Martin in the New York Times, the influential dance critic, um, wrote, you know, even went as far as to suggest that they stop with the ethnic or racial dancers, that he notices that people are walking out of the theater. And um, Ted Sean would sometimes finance those groups himself. So um, he, I think he saw that the programming was in a way a sort of response to a negative impact he had on representation of um, you know, ethnic racial dance outside of um, ballet and modern. So I think you have a selection about the opening of the theater that you wanna, are yeah. gonna read to us. I should say, this goes along the lines with saying Ted Sean lived his life in chapters. Everything was a commemoration for him. There was an anniversary for everything. Even at the opening of the theater, was already a commemoration of the first tea dance, um, which was had with the men dancers. So it was part of his publicity. It was built into his DNA to commemorate everything in his career, a Ruth St. Dennis's career. Every time something had to be memorialized, um, and so much so that Walter Terry, another dance critic, wrote a really great article called "Ted Sean's Anniversaries," which were all about how Ted Sean everything became a press release for um, Ted Sean. So I love being here at the 90th anniversary. I could somehow continue this um, tradition. So this is a description of, um, you want me to read this passage? Okay. So um, this is just before the theater opens. In addition to his personal grief over Mumaw's absence, that's his lover, Bart Mumaw, who was um, enlisted in the army, Sean was also experiencing a low-grade nightmare of activity from the chaos surrounding the premiere program in the new theater. He had difficulty managing the complex personalities of those most directly involved in the production, including some of the biggest names in the dance world, such as Bronislava Nijinska and Agnes DeMille, on top of all the remaining tasks yet to be completed for the building itself. Amidst the chaos just days before the theater's official opening night, Sean invited faculty, students, and staff into the new theater to experience a moment of calm and shared purpose. He dedicated the stage by performing his dance liturgy, the doxology, and in keeping with the season's theme of American dance, his signature four dances based on American folk music. It helped galvanize the pillow community. In the remaining days leading to opening night, everyone pitched in, students wheelbarrowed heaps of debris and tucked them away just out of the view of visitors. Fern Helsher, who was his assistant collected stray pieces of lumber that had been strewn across the lawn. Dancer Sammy Steen prepared a bazaar, the prototype of the pillow store. <laughs> During the evening of opening night, Thursday, July 9th, 1942, Sean ran into John Martin, who arrived with Walter Terry to participate in this extraordinary event. Martin shocked Sean with his presence and praise. Sean claimed Martin called the theater, quote, the most beautiful thing he ever saw. In print, Martin's enthusiasm was slightly more nuanced. He described it as a, quote, an up-to-date theater, innocent of any taint of quaintness or self-conscious rusticity. He went on to say it was the embodiment of New England frugalism, not a wasted nail or unnecessary board anywhere, and especially praised the ingenuity of the raked audience seating, an innovation for 
dance, allowing the entire stage to be visible from any of the 525 seats in the auditorium. A little after five o'clock, the asbestos curtain went up. Mary Campbell performed the Star Spangled Banner on the piano. Then board president Ra Reginald Wright stepped from behind the brown curtain to introduce Sean, who read a tribute to Muma and the men dancers, whose effort and artistry made the theater a possibility and whose absence due to the war was deeply felt. When the curtain finally opened, it exposed the natural wood of the theater's back wall, an ideal backdrop for a program of decidedly American fair, or as Martin put it, quote, so unpretentious that it seemed to have grown out of the surroundings. Indeed, and you have that effect when you see the concert tonight. I think it's a beautiful tribute to this moment. Indeed, the theater was designed so that the rear wall of the stage was composed of two large sliding doors that when opened revealed the scenic Berkshire Hills as a backdrop. The debut program was a perfect way to introduce the first season's survey of American dance. First came a suite of square dances performed by local residents and choreograph choreographed by Sammy Spring, a resident of nearby Otis, who had a reputation as an outstanding square dance caller. A series of concert dances derived from American folk dances followed. And then I go on to describe Hell on Wheels, which was Agnes DeMille's um, contribution to the program and in which Sean appeared. He was very nervous about being on stage. He was a sort of circus barker wearing this big mustache. There are some great photos in the piece. And he was very uncomfortable about it because it wasn't, I don't think, dig it wasn't a god. <laughs> and, uh, and so he had some concern about it. Plus he had, understandably, a lot of other um, concerns he was contending with. But um, he goes on to perform it. And, um, um, and I should say Hell on Wheels, the, that dance that Agnes DeMille created was the, some of the early work that went on to become Rodeo, her signature dance. So here's interesting. The next day, Aaron Copeland came to the performance, after which he whisked away DeMille into the studio so she could get her first listen to his score for Rodeo. Sean overheard what he later described as Copeland, quote, banging out jazz on the stage piano claiming to have yelled, stop that dreadful noise, but neither Copeland nor DeMille heard him. Later, he admitted to telling DeMille he thought Copeland represented the antichrist in music. <laughs> he even told her, this kind of music is the very reason we are having a war. I will welcome Mr. Copeland and his page Turner, that's Leonard Bernstein, <laughs> as guests, but I will not salute them as artists. Copeland and Bernstein laughed when they heard about Sean's reaction to their presence. Um, now, Sean, did not have this reaction. This is according to Agnes DeMille, who loved to um, uh, chafe Ted Sean. But this is, um, but the idea that this was happening here at, during that weekend is also, I think, pretty astonishing. I, I think you couldn't see because you were reading, but Pam's face looked quite like, yeah, I know about picking up that piece of stray lumber to get ready for opening <laughs> night. <laughs> so one of the things that um, I think is remarkable about Sean is how much he wrote, not just his correspondence, but that he really, his series of lectures, books he wrote. And I'm wondering if that was, I mean, his life, his writings, how, how what was that discovery like for you, that he had uh, published so much? Well, it's astonishing because, I mean, apart from the nine books he wrote, and he also wrote editorials, and he wrote program notes, so there was that. But that was part of the, you know, that's an expression of his missionary zeal for dance. That part of what he was doing was trying to get dance out in the ether and written in a way that, the way people wrote about visual art or the way people wrote about theater. He wanted to give a language and a voice for dance that, uh, you know, he, w he came out of and was, you know, he was a theology student as a young child and was in a way kicked out of um, theology school because of his desire to dance. And that was because there was a horrific anti-dance movement, late 19th century, early 20th century, which was all this moralizing about how dance would lead to social demise, how it was immoral. So most of the, the main strain or theme that runs throughout his writing and his dances is that dance could be a path to the divine, it could be sacred, it could be art, writing against, um, you know, library full of um, books and pamphlets about dance's um, dysgenia, shall we say. <laughs> I also should say the biggest collection of anti-dance literature I found, this fascinated me, I found in the library of Alfred Kinsey, who was also 
Sean was connected to, the great sexologist and the writer of the Kinsey Reports. In fact, Sean gave his uh, sexual story um, to Kinsey scientists. So Kinsey, Sean was part of the um, Kinsey Reports that transformed American society and its attitudes towards sexuality. It also transformed Sean's life. So there's a correspondence between Kinsey and Sean and an interesting relationship that developed um, which led me to the Kinsey archives to do research on Sean. And, um, and there I found the greatest cache, the largest collection of anti-dance literature because Kinsey was uniquely interested in dancing as well. He believed like understanding dance was paramount to understanding human sexuality, which is why he reached out to Sean. So one of the things I have been thinking about, um, and it has to do with the conversation we had a couple of years ago about the, the end of Sean's life is kind of the, the birth of modern day gay rights. And, and you already started by saying that, he, you know, in the, in the early part of the 20th century, he's um, reading Hadlock Ellis. And so there's this way that it feels like there's a, a parallel history of, of um, a parallel queer history, a history of gay rights, a, a, a history of sexuality, that I'm wondering, like, Sean feels like the perfect vehicle to tell that story. And um, that feels like maybe that was a, an emerging discovery in the process. Well, Sean thought he was the perfect vehicle to tell that story. So in the late 60s, when he starts seeing changes and Boys in the Band and Mike Wallace does a report on the homosexuals and he starts seeing organizations come together like the um, gay, early gay rights organizations come together, he um, you know, decides to tell his story anew. So he reaches out to one of his former students who's a writer, and this is right after, right after Ruth St. Dennis dies. So he remains married to Ruth St. Dennis all his life, um, even though they live apart. And as soon as she dies, he wants to retell the story in his life in a way um, connected to all of these changes that he sees going on around um, gay lives and possibilities, because he sees his work as central to the changes that are happening. So do you think, I mean, it's to put Havelock Ellis in there makes some sense, but Kinsey feels like, wow, a discovery that must, that maybe you as a dance historian weren't necessarily expecting that you would be in the Kinsey archives. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my last question um, before we take uh, some questions or comments from uh, some folks here is, I am imagining that it might be very possible to have at times hated Ted Sean and loved him both you know, on the grounds here, certainly uh, studying his uh, life writings and dances so closely. Did you love him and hate him simultaneously on the same days? Did you go through periods where like, I wish I'd never signed that damn contract? Because, you know, so th your, your relationship with him. All those things, um, all those things. I tried, I would have to say there was also I, this is a scholarly book in the sense that um, I was interested in connecting his life to broader currents in American culture and to theatrical tradition. But there's a deeply personal story here. And part of the, um, one of the remarkable aspects of Sean's life is how he persevered under um, enormous constraints. And so he, of course, had tremendous entitlement and flexibility being a white male to travel and to do a lot of things. So there was that. But I always, I still to this day remain somewhat astonished of the sort of sacrifices he made to pursue his vision of what dancing was. And I don't think all of those sacrifices, you know, so that to me remains remarkable. This, the fact that this pillow exists, you know, too, is I think testament to, um, um, his tremendous grit. And it was also hard to say, I, I mean, also just being aware of trying to distance myself a bit to say that Ted Sean wanted to dance to be taught in a college and he never, he had an opportunity to do that a little bit, but to realize that, oh, I'm chair of a dance department that has all scholarship and performance, like to just realize that a lot of what, it's easy to be in a position to criticize someone that created a world and a life that I'm now able to have and other scholars are able to have. So there was also a way of um, uh, 
admiring a lot of the impact, but not necessarily having, you know, but still being really clear about what important criticisms and um, fallout needs to be memorialized. Great, thank you. Questions or comments? A question about uh, Sean as kind of an amateur ethnographer going out and studying dance forms. And uh, to put him in conversation uh, with you as the mo imaginary moderator, uh, Pearl Primus or Catherine Dunham, um, Maya Darren, uh, who, who did similar kinds of work of going and um, deeply investigating uh, dances of um, maybe their own heritage or maybe other people's heritage as well. Well, I would say with all, with maybe the exception of Maya Darren, Catherine Dunham was trained to do this ethnography, right? So, and came at a later date. So in a way, I, I think there's a similarity in that there was a deep, sustained engagement with um, a, a culture and learning dances that later were theatricalized. But I also, th and also Catherine Dunham wrote about those dances and wrote about her experience there as well. But I think Catherine Dunham had a very different, um, I know she had a very different impulse for studying those dances that, and she had a very different skill set in being able to study them and do that ethnographic work. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they can, I think there's a, um, a broad <laughs> a similarity between them, but Sean had none of that, um, uh, I, I would say sensitivity or skill in doing that ethnographic work. Right, right, because she's training as an anthropologist and that was never Sean's right, right first. And I would yeah. say even maybe one of the remarkable things about Catherine Dunham's work when you read her ethnographies is how she chronicles the many people she encounters and the conditions in which she interfaces with them. Like she's very clear about that. Sean's writings remain very diffuse. So even when he writes about meeting the Uled Nail, the um, women dancers he meets in North Africa, they don't have names necessarily. He doesn't really explore the, the conditions of their life. He actually ignores, he sees extreme poverty, um, that they live under. He sees how some of the dances they perform are outlawed by the French colonial government. Um, he sees how, um, you know, he sees all of these, um, how they are socially ostracized, but he still writes about the dances without writing all of the realities of their lives or why these dances would still be meaningful to them given this extraordinary social and political context in which they perform them. So that's a great loss that he would perpetuate certain ideas about these you know, African and um, Arab dances without really attending to the realities of the lives that he sees firsthand, right? He's so obsessed with, I think at one point I write something like, he's so obsessed with, you know, the dance that he somewhat overlooks the dancers and their lives. And so um, that would be a big distinction I would make with someone like Catherine Dunham and Ted Sean. Yes. Although, Kat, I want to say, Ted Sean really admired Catherine Dunham and tried very hard to get her at the pillow. But I don't think they could pay her enough. She was making a lot more money. Um, but there's an exchange between them about that. Uh, she did come after, after Sean. There's great, come to the archives. You can, see, you can see a celebration of her life. Yeah, with Ronald K. Brown doing an extraordinary solo uh, in her uh, honor. And Ron Brown will be here next week. So it all, it all connects. This is a question about uh, Sean and his support or not of choreographer Merce Cunningham. I, so Sean was not a fan of many postmodern and even modern, even his own students. He, he wrestled with the very idea of modern dance. But I do recall being that there's a comment that he was very impressed with Merce Cunningham. Um, I'm sorry? Who could not be? Oh. <laughs> Well, and he also well I, I'm sure Sean would have found a way because in a way he was, you know, his own work was where his heart was. So there was, you know, he was very critical of a lot of other choreographers. But I think the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weigh in here and say that I feel like there's this way in which his shift from um, thinking of himself only as an artist to becoming somebody who was also curating the work of others, he created opportunities for uh, Cunningham and there are some commissions that are... Um, I don't think that he liked them very much, though, but he did make room for, for them to be made. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. 
on that extensive tour that uh, uh, Ted Chan did with Ruth St. Dennis in uh, the early 20s, that they started in Japan and went into India. And there's wonderful footage that Sean, uh, comfortable with the new technology of film, uh, took at that time that's available in the New York Public Library. Uh, do you have a, a story from their trip to India? So in their time in India, um, Ruth St. Dennis, when they first get to India, Ruth St. Dennis performs one of her Indian notch dances to tremendous success. And this, for Sean, cinches the idea that he needed a dance of Shiva, because one to sort of be as impressive as hers was. And he spends a lot of the time in India away from the company, Ruth St. Dennis was performing, but he goes out on his own. I sort of chronicle this uh, you know, tremendous um, mission throughout India to create this dance of Shiva, talking with, um, going to ashrams and getting costumes and going to a temple of Shiva that was very important. And he choreographed there and took these beautiful photographs there dressed as Shiva. So he sort of went on a quest while he was in India to um, create a work that he thought would be the counterpart to Ruth St. Dennis's Indian dances. And that became a signature dance of his once he came back from the tour. So you can find the book back here and uh, get your own copy. Um, you'll have to supply your own matching outfit. We can't do that for you here. Um, so delighted to have you here talking Thank about this book. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here.